Welcome to the Brass and Woodwind Shop. I have a very unusual instrument that came into my shop for a repad. This is a contrabass clarinet. It is one octave below a bass clarinet and it's two octaves below the regular B flat clarinet. And the customer is an engineer so he uh, got this all uh, ready for me. He took a picture of both sides of the instrument and then he also put the pad numbers here. He did buy pads. I do not have the contrabass clarinet pads for this particular instrument. Uh, they have holes in them and I've only worked on a couple of these in my life. So it's not something that you do every day. It is a good idea when you're working with an instrument that you're not familiar with to get a picture of it first uh, before you take it apart. And I may have to, I actually probably will have to refer to this as I'm going. Here's the instrument. Uh, this model is affectionately known as the paper clip for obvious reasons. It has the extension to get it down to the low C. You know, if you don't need the low C, you can put the bell on there, or you can put the extension on. Then the extra two keys can get you down to the low C. The B flat clarinet has four tabs that are played by the right hand pinky, and it goes down to a low E. The bass clarinet has five tabs. It has the extra one that goes down to the low E flat. The contrabass clarinet also has the five tabs like the bass clarinet and the lowest one takes you down to the E flat. On the B flat clarinet there are four keys that are played with the left hand pinky. The contrabass clarinet has an extra one. Uh, this one right here. That gets you down to the low D. To get down to the low C it is controlled by the right hand thumb. On the B flat clarinet, the thumb just holds up the instrument. On the contrabass clarinet, it, the instrument's held up by a floor peg, and the thumb controls the low C sharp and then the low C keys. If you double the length of the tubing of an instrument, it lowers it by one octave. So the bass clarinet has double the tubing of the B flat clarinet. And the contrabass clarinet is one octave lower than the bass clarinet. So this actually has double the tubing of the bass clarinet. But it actually has a little bit more tubing than that because this goes down to the low E flat. This has the extension that puts it into the low C. So the contrabass clarinet is four times longer to get down to the low E. But then it's also another whole clarinet length longer to get down to the low C. So the contrabass clarinet is actually five times longer than the B-flat clarinet. This is different than the contra-alto clarinet. The contra-alto clarinet is in the key of E-flat and it is double the length of an alto clarinet. This clarinet was made in France by LeBlanc. Thankfully this clarinet does come apart in the middle. There's a little screw if you take that off you can slide it apart and that will make it a lot easier to work on. The clarinet is still complicated, but it's a lot more manageable now that it's in two pieces. I'm going to start by disassembling this. I have my screw board, and I'm going to use that to put the screws in. I have never fully disassembled a contrabass clarinet before, so I'm going to try to put these screws in there in a logical order. But I do have a notepad with me, and I will take notes as I go to make sure that everything ends up where it's supposed to. I'm going to start with the, I think it's the A flat, no, the A key. This clarinet has the pivot screws that are cylindrical at the end. So these you want to keep in order. Some pivot screws, it does not really matter, but these ones you do want to keep in order. So I'm going to have to be extra careful to notate these screws correctly. So I'm going to do that in just a minute. And this has a lot of pivot screws with it. And then I'm going to take off the A key. When I put the screws in there, I put the top on the top and then the bottom on the bottom. So this is the top pivot screw. And then there's the one that's on the bottom, which I'm going to put at the bottom. And that helps me keep them straight. This is getting a little complicated. I need to figure out what these key names are called, or at least so that I can put it back together when I'm done. I do have the uh, the Allied catalog. It has the picture of the bass clarinet, and it says what the key names are, and that will kind of help me on this, but there are a lot of extra keys too. So I just have to come up with names that I can remember, and I'm going to call this one the thumb ring. I know it's not a ring on this one, but on a regular clarinet, this is a thumb ring, so that's what I'm going to call this one. 
And that's going to be the next key that I take off. And then I just have to take off one key at a time, keeping things in order. Now this key is bent, so probably the pivot screws are going to be bent and they're going to need uh, straightening out too. But that's probably the big reason why this clarinet did not play in the first place. But these pads are questionable and they are due for replacing. I am taking notes on this uh, thumb ring. I'm writing down where the screws are on the screw board so I can keep that straight when I'm done. These keys are the F sharp keys and there's a hinge rod that goes through both of those. The next one, F sharp keys. This key is controlled by the lower joint. I'm not really sure what that key is called. I just looked it up. This is the E flat, B flat, bis key. I have my book and a bass clarinet to try to help me out here. This is an extremely complicated mechanism right here. There are a lot of different keys that go a lot of different places and they hold down things in kind of a funny way. On a bass clarinet, if you want to get the throat B flat, you'd push down the register key or the register lever and also the A and A flat keys and then that gives you the throat B flat. If you want to jump up to the second register, you'd push down both of these keys and the one key closes this and it opens the register key. On the contrabass clarinet, there is a second register key, so you have two register keys and it goes back and forth depending upon which note you're playing as to which one is opening. On a contrabass clarinet, if you want to get the throat B flat, you have to push down the register lever and then the A and the A flat key, it has a, uh, a connector between the two and that controls the, uh, the register and the throat B flat key and it goes in between the two. And then to further complicate things, there's a mechanism that goes down to the lower joint and it's controlled by the GD key and that switches red from one register key to the other. When you're playing the clarinet, you do not need to worry about all that. The mechanism does it for you, but when you're working on the instrument, you need to keep all of that straight and you need to make sure that you get the right keys in the right places when you're done. Next, I took off the register keys and the connector lever. Next, I'm going to take off the GD connection lever, or at least that's what I'm calling it. I'm not sure if that's the correct name. This one has a pivot screw on one side. On the other side, there's a combination uh, hinge rod and pivot screw. The hinge rod holds in these keys and levers. The pivot screw at the end holds in the other lever. Okay, and that one should release about four keys or three right here. Look at those keys and levers. Those are highly unusual for instruments, but I guess it's what works on this one. This hinge rod holds on two rocker levers right there. And I also uh, drew a little diagram so I know which direction is the top and the bottom. Otherwise they might get switched around and be hard to figure out. Now I could figure it out, but this will probably save a lot of time. Now there's just one more piece that needs to come off. There's a little rocker that uh, controls the A flat and the A keys. So that's coming off and then this section is all apart. I also drew a little diagram for this one so I know which direction it goes on. There are my notes and hopefully that helps me keep everything in order. Now it's time to take off the old pads and corks, but before I take it off, I'm going to check the height from the pad cup to the top of the pad, and I'm going to try to match that when I put the new pads in. These pads have the washer and the nut that screws in, and they have a hole in the middle of the pad. So that's going to make these pads a little bit harder to level. So I want to make sure I get it as close as I can to level before I put it in. Now I'm going to remove the corks. I have an old razor that I use for that. I keep my razors once they get dull, because a dull razor works fine on removing old corks. And that way I get to use the razor twice, once when it's sharp and then once when it's dull. I'm removing the old cork and also all of the glue that's on there because the cork sticks a lot better to metal than it does to old glue. This key has four different corks on it. Usually they don't have that many. Some keys have a few corks, but usually not four. 
Now I need to remove the pads. There's a little nut that goes over that and then a washer in there. Okay. I need to retrieve that washer out of there. Okay, they did not glue these pads in. They only screwed them in. When I put them in though, I'm going to put some glue on there. So when I need to level the pads, I can heat it up and then level the pads into place. Now it's time to buff the keys in the body. I'm using the white buffing compound because this is nickel plated. So what I'm going to do is just grab a key and buff it and keep doing that until the job is done. And you have to be very careful when you do this because you can lose parts, you can get them twisted around the wheel if you're not careful. Um, I've done a lot of these over the years, so I've gotten pretty good at not uh, getting things uh, destroyed. However, uh, quite often I do have something drop on the floor. Um, sometimes it grabs it and throws it on the floor. Uh, probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe every other clarinet that I buff, I lose a key onto the floor. But almost always they are not uh, damaged at all. You just pick it up and keep going. How long this takes also depends on how tarnished the keys are. These keys are fairly tarnished and they're large, so this one's going to take a while. I'm probably looking at maybe a half an hour right here with what I have. And I'm not going to make you watch me do the whole half hour. I'm going to turn off the camera and I will show you what it, they look like when I'm finished. I'm done polishing the keys and they're shiny. Uh, now I need to do the body of the clarinet. Uh, the body isn't too bad. I don't think it's going to be too hard to uh, buff that. I do have to watch out for these springs because if the wheel catches on the springs it can make a mess of the spring and then you end up having to replace it. It can be done but it, ju it just takes more time. One of the ways of not messing up a spring is like for example this spring right here instead of making the wheel go so it hits it this direction you would make sure the wheel hits it from the other direction and that way it's just going to buff the spring. It will not uh, it will not grab it and pull it back. So if I'm careful I should be able to buff the body without damaging the springs at all. Another thing about buffing, it does take away a little bit of metal, so you have to be careful to do it as little as possible. So once it's shiny, you stop buffing, you don't keep going. I'm done buffing the upper joint of the clarinet. Now I have to go through with a rag by hand and clean up the residue from the buffing compound. After that, the upper joint will be ready to put back together. This part is easy. All I do is clean off the residue from the buffing compound. And also, if there's anywhere I couldn't get with the buffing wheel, I clean that up by hand. I also do this to the keys after I buff them. Now it's time to put the corks on the keys. I have my cork right here. I have several different thicknesses. When I'm working on a bass clarinet or a B-flat clarinet, I know exactly what thicknesses of cork go on the keys. On this one, I'm not quite as sure. So I'm just going to give it my best guess. And how I do it is I heat up the key where the cork goes. And I take the cork and push it onto there like that. And then I cut it, uh, I cut off whatever is not supposed to be on there. Um, and if you're wondering how this sticks, I have some um, adhesive cement that I put onto the corks and it's already on there. Once you heat it up, it makes it stick to the key. So I'm going to finish cutting that cork there. This key is done. Several of these keys are going to need more than one cork. Let's see, this one, hmm, I'm not sure exactly where the corks go. I think one goes over here, probably this thickness right here. I'm not sure if it gets another one somewhere else on it. Um, if it does, I'm going to figure it out when I put the clarinet back together, and then I will have to put it on then.
Or I can also put one on and then I'll pull it off if I need to if it does not go on there. So there's the cork. And then, and this key I think gets two, one there and one there. Um, think about this thickness right here. So what I do when I am using cork, I always save a chunk of cork if there's anything good left on it anything usable and then I put it on my cork board here and I'll just save it until I need it. Uh, cork is fairly expensive and you do not want to waste cork so I use as much as I can and if there's a little piece that will work on a key I will save it. Okay, so that one gets a cork there and then I am going to put a thinner cork right here so you heat up the key for a few seconds and then you take the cork and push it onto there and it only takes like a couple seconds for it to stick onto there. And then you cut off whatever does not look like the cork that's supposed to be on there. And these razors do not last very long. I probably will need a new razor by the time I'm done with this clarinet. Now see this one has a uh, an adjustment screw so it does not get a cork right there. Not sure if it gets cork there or not. I'm going to put one there. I might be pulling it off later, but I think it gets one right there. I'm done putting the corks on the keys, or at least I gave it my best guess. If it's too thick, I can sand it down with sandpaper. If they're too thin, I can replace them. And if I forgot to put a cork on, I can replace it too. So now it's time to put the pads on. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what pad goes where. The customer ordered these pads from Music Medic, so I'm assuming they are the correct size. Okay, this is easy so far. Originally they did not put glue on the pads, but I'm going to put a thin layer of glue on there. Uh, and that will help the pads, that will help me be able to level the pads better when I put it on the instrument. The chances that the pads will seat evenly without any uh, leveling is very small. The type of glue I'm using is hot glue. It's like the kind you use on craft projects with a hot glue gun. But I use it for the pads and it works well. The little pads do not have the screws and the holes in the middle. So I can just put those right into the instrument without having to screw them in. With that, I'm going to end the video. In the next video, I'm going to assemble the upper joint and get that adjusted and ready to go.